so see let's see if the mic is working because lots of people will listen to this question and so yes. okay. okay okay so you said on a recent live stream that you were too you didn't have enough energy to answer this question but you said it was intriguing so i was wondering if you had the energy to answer how someone might help someone that has borderline personality disorder. <laughs> <laughs> By example. By example. Give an example. No, 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 I, I, don't, I don't mean that precisely. I mean that the, let's not take borderline personality disorder precisely as, as the example, okay? I understand the, the, the question. The question, to some degree, is how do you help someone that's lost? And the answer to that is, if they aren't willing to not be lost, you cannot help them. And I would also say that as a clinician. You see, I mean, it's, an, it's a statement that's informed, I would say, by my mythological knowledge, but also by straight clinical wisdom. Not, not mine, particularly. I mean, one of the things that Carl Rogers pointed out was that there were necessary preconditions for entering into a therapeutic relationship. And that, that would be really any relationship where the mutual flourishing of the two people involved was the paramount goal. And one of the preconditions was that both people had to want that to happen. And Rogers believed he didn't know how to get the horse to drink once you had brought it to the water. And I've thought about that a lot, because when people are really lost, Sometimes they're so lost that, that they can't be found. And I think the only thing that you can do in a situation like that is get your life together and, sh and manifest the reality of an alternative mode of being. That's what you've got. And so, that's the only way I know of to solve an intractable problem. And I would say, the reason that I went down that direction with regards to borderline personality disorder is because it's one of the most serious of the personality disorders, very difficult to treat. And so, I'll generalize from that to situations that are very difficult to deal with. And, you know, there's a statement too, and this has nothing to do with borderline personality disorder per se. There's a statement in the New Testament that's really vicious. In fact, there's a number of them, but this is a particularly vicious one, and that is... Don't cast pearls before swine. And what that means is, if you're trying to help and it doesn't work, then stop helping. It's not helping. Right? It may be just wasting your time. It might be making things worse. You know, if you're, if you're offering something and it's not taken, then perhaps you should be offering it somewhere else. And sometimes, if you offer a hand and the person won't take it, you have to stop offering the hand. And then what you do is you go off and you have your life. And sometimes that means in people's lives, for example, that they have to leave their family members behind. There's a scene in the New Testament, this is another very harsh scene, where Christ is walking down the road with his disciples. I hope I've got this story right, but I've got it essentially right. And his mother calls to him and says, I believe that he's supposed to come back to the home because his uncle has died and that there's going to be a funeral. And he turns to his mother and says uh, something like, let the dead bury their dead. I'm about my father's business. It's something like that. And you read that and you think, huh, <laughs> that should have been edited out. <laughs> no, but it shouldn't have been edited out because it's exactly right. Because sometimes the thing you do is walk away. Because there's no other solution. And if you are trapped in pathological relationships and you see no way out of them, if you... If someone who is sinking has their hands around your neck and is pulling you down, you're not obligated to drown with them. You know, there's a rule too if you're a lifeguard. You know, some of you have had lifeguard training. How do you approach someone who's drowning and panicking in the water? <laughs> Feet out, right, like this. It's like, I'll save you, but that doesn't mean you get to drown me while I'm doing it. And if it's you drown or both of us drown, it's you drown. And that's wisdom, that's not cruelty, right? So, yeah. I've had a couple of questions about dialogue and engaging in dialogue with people. So the first um, issue that I face is uh, I have a very high need for intellectual stimulation. 
And I can't get that with most people. It's, it's something like um, you, can, you can have a dialogue for a time, but then... They, it's high trade openness. Yeah. 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 And, and, and but then they sort of run out of ideas and they, they can't yeah. keep up and uh, it sort of falls apart. And okay. I think this is a problem that intellectuals have um, quite frequently is that they, they sort of, once they start reading difficult and rewarding stuff, yeah. they, they stop wanting to talk to regular people. And I think that contributes to the disconnect that you see between intellectuals and working class people and, and stuff like that. And the other question I had was about... Okay, wait, I don't know if that's a question. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I, I believe there's a question in there, but I... I the question is, how, how, do you, how should we address that? How should I address it? And uh, is that something that can be addressed? Well, part of, part of the answer to that is that's what the universities were for. I mean, you know, not everybody is equipped to or interested in engaging in high-level discussion of abstract and creative ideas. You know, you hear this idea that everyone's creative. That's a lie. It's as straightforward as that. True creativity is very, very rare. And so, and if you happen to be a creative person, or if you happen to be someone who's profoundly interested in ideas, you are in a pronounced minority, just as you are if you happen to be extremely extroverted or extremely agreeable or extremely conscientious. These are minority issues, and what you do is you find like-minded people who are capable of engaging that. You know, heavyweight, heavyweight weightlifters compete with heavyweight weightlifters for a reason, and everyone thinks that's fine. And the same thing applies to intellectual and creative endeavors. So what you do is you try to find a community where that's that's the nature of the community, and you likely have to find a relationship like that as well, you know, so. I don't think so. I think what contributes to the siloing is the arrogance that goes along with it. Because if you're, you can be interested in ideas, and you can be creative. Well, that's the arrogance of the intellect, right? That's the thing the Catholic Church had warned about for centuries, is the arrogance of the intellect. So, because if you're... If you're wise as well as smart, and there is no relationship between being smart and being wise, they are not the same thing. There's no quick pathway from smart to wise. And many of the people who I've known who were very wise, were, well, some of them were intellectually impaired and were still wise, you know. So, it's the arrogance that brings up the block. And I see this, for example, happening in the United States in particular, because the last time I went down there, for example, I, was, I had friends down there, and, and, and some of those friends are very, very smart people. And some of them were talking about the Trump voters. And they were talking about the Trump voters with contempt. And I thought, you better watch that, because that's 50% of the damn population. And it might be convenient to think that they're stupid and beneath you, but it's not conducive to a civil state, and there's no evidence that it's true, because there isn't a straight line between intelligent and wise. And so I think that if, you're, if your character is developed, and you're intelligent, you can have your siloed creative community, but you develop enough wisdom so that you can see all the things that people can do that are of high ethical utility, that are outside the intellectual domain. You know, and I think that's why in the New Testament, I think that's why Christ is a carpenter. Right? Because, well, first of all, a carpenter is one of those jobs that when you're dishonest, it manifests itself immediately because what you build falls down. And so if you're an honest carpenter, you build a good house. So, so that there's a nice metaphor there. But it's also, it's also um, a warning, in some sense, against the, the equation of intellectual brilliance with moral superiority. And so if the intellects would drop their moral superiority, and fat chance there is of that, then the divide between the working class, say, and the elite would, would resolve. And there's every reason to have respect for decent working class people. I mean, it's on their labor as the left-wingers at least hypothetically agree that the entire edifice of the culture is, is resting. So you can have your cake and eat it too, but you have to not assume that your niche makes you superior. And it's very difficult for smart people, especially smart... There's this scene in Nietzsche's, it's in Thus Spake Zarathustra, where Zarathustra, the prophet, comes down from the mountain and he comes into a public square and there's this crowd around this little midget who's only about this high, who has a gigantic ear. And everyone is 
marveling at him. Well, that's what the modern intellect is like. It's a midget with a giant, well, mouth, generally, not an ear. <laughs> and the, the, the being is underdeveloped, but the intellect is hyper-activated. And, and it makes the person extraordinarily unbalanced. And it's partly because, they, A, they can't compete outside the intellectual realm. And that makes them very bitter, because they tend to think, well, God, I'm so smart, everything should just come to me. It's like, sorry, that's not how the world works. And, and it, it also, that, that, and that, that, that attitude is immediately evident to people that they're talking to when they talk in the manner that they talk, if they are arrogant intellectuals of that sort. You see that in, The Simpsons did a good job of that with comic book guy, right? I mean, he was completely useless in every possible dimension with an IQ of about 160. And it's very annoying to people who have an IQ of 160 that they can also be completely useless. But it happens a lot, so...